So good afternoon. I am the Reverend Stephen Osella. I'm the pastor at New North Church in Hingham, Mass. And speaking on behalf of the Mission and Justice Committee, serving the southeast area of the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ, we are presenting this Zoom project for you. It's, we're calling it Food Insecurity in a Pandemic World. Originally, it was called Food Insecurity in a Post-Pandemic World. And then we realize we're not quite there yet. So what we'll be discussing, um, we're going to go from a national view to a regional view to a very local view of all the issues caused by the pandemic. You know, it, it's made things worse and we're, we're going to find out how and hopefully we'll answer a couple of questions regarding how churches can help. And our first speaker is Sherry Andes from Bread for the World. She's the senior regional organizer for the Northeast, and she's well-versed in, in what's going on in our part of the, the country. So Sherry, hit it. I'm going to make you the host. You're good to go. Sherry Andes. So thank you, Reverend Asella, and thank you to everybody who helped organize this event. Can you all see my screen? Yep. Great, great, thanks. As Reverend Asella said, I'm Sherry Andes. I'm the Senior Northeast Regional Organizer for Bread for the World. Bread for the World is a national organization that urges our lawmakers to end hunger at home and abroad. We work with churches and other organizations to make that happen. I am gonna tell you a story today, the story of the, ta the child tax credit. Um, but before I begin, I'd like to start with a scripture. Matthew 26, 11. If you know the text of that scripture, would you pop it in the chat, please? And if you don't know it, maybe you could quickly look it up for me. Pop it the in Bible's the chat. propping up my laptop. <laughs> Whoever gets it first gets a prize. Twenty six eleven. Twenty six eleven. See, nobody knew it by heart. Okay, go ahead. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, so the poor you will always have with you. That's a rather infamous saying of Jesus. And in this country it, and in the world, it feels like that's pretty much true. But if there's a silver lining to the pandemic, it's that we have learned not just, uh, that not just over the course of many years, but in just a few months, it is possible to dramatically decrease poverty and child food insecurity uh, in, the, in this country. And that's the story I'd like to tell you. It begins in 1997 with the Taxpayer Relief Act under President Bill Clinton. It was a bipartisan taxpayer uh, relief act, one of the biggest in our uh, history. And um, it, um, it put in place a number of tax cuts and tax credits, one of which was a child tax credit. And that tax credit has been um, increased several times over the course of history to keep place with inflation. Now, along comes the coronavirus and the 2020 world pandemic. And then comes the American Rescue Plan under President Biden and the tax credit is enhanced. So when a family was getting $2,000 for a child under six annually, they can now get $3,600 for a child under six annually. And where they were getting $2,000 for children above six annually, they can now get $3,000 $3, for a child above six annually. And perhaps even more importantly, they can get half of that amount 
in monthly payments of $250 to $300 a month. And that's incredibly important for food insecurity. And if you think about it, if you get $2,000 at the end of the year in one lump sum, you are more likely to use that to pay a large bill, a large debt, or towards a large uh, purchase, like towards uh, a used car, perhaps. But when you're getting $250 to $300 a month, it makes its way into your food bill. It makes its way into your rent. And that's what the child tax credit is um, meant to do. Um, so it's this policy change that was really effective. Before the CTC was enhanced by the American Rescue Plan, very low income families were not entitled to the full credit, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. 27 million children, including roughly half of Black and Latino children and half of children in rural communities, received less than the full credit amount because their parents' income was too low. And if the credit exceeded the taxes a family owed, they could only receive up to 1,400 per child as a refund rather than the 2,000. The American Rescue Plan made the credit fully refundable and fully accessible to very low income families, a game changer for these families. So what has been the impact of all these policies? According to a Columbia University study, over its six month existence, the CTC payments kept 3.7 million children from poverty. It reached 61.2 million children in December, an increase of 2 million children over six months. On its own, the child tax credit reduced monthly child poverty by close to 30%. In terms of equity, we can see that there was pretty robust um, re percentage uh, decline in child poverty across the racial groups, but you can see that it's higher for white uh, communities. Over its six month existence, I beg your pardon, a national survey um, saw that black and Latino families were less likely to anticipate receiving the new tax credit. Also amongst the lowest income groups, of which people of color are disproportionately represented, 20% did not receive the first payment because they were unbanked or had not filed taxes recently. But as greater anti-poverty gains became visible, more communities of color did uh, increase their use of the child tax credit. What else do we know about its impact? We know that for in families with incomes below 35,000, the largest chunk of change they used was for food. And that's really important. Um, the enhanced child tax credit reduced childhood food insecurity in the United States by 25%. Not only was the child tax credit lifting people out of poverty, but it was also making their families more food secure as well, with the largest portion of the CTC funds going to food. In fact, CTC is not just an anti-poverty tool, it's a power anti powerful anti-hunger tool. The impact of the enhanced CTC in Massachusetts was that nearly 1.1 million children received the CTC payments and 93% of Massachusetts households with their incomes below 35,000 spent their payments on basic needs, food, clothing, rent, mortgage, and utilities. So this should be a happy ending story, right? Right? The um, CTC has the potential to do for families today what social security did for the elderly in the 30s. It's that transformational. However, it expired on December 15th because the Build Back Better legislation passed, failed to pass the Senate. And that happened because one senator in one state in a 50-50 legislation put legislature put his foot down against the child tax credit. And that senator was Senator Joe Manchin. 
His main opposition to the bill is that he wants a firm work requirement. He has other oppositions, but that's his main opposition. However, the vast majority of families receiving the child tax credit are already working. And there is no evidence that the expanded CTC will discourage parents from working. Even if it did discourage some parents, the effect is likely to be minimal, while the overall help for struggling families will be substantial. So where does the CTC stand now? Oops, sorry. My Build Back Better did not pass in 2021 and the enhanced child tax credit, tax credit expired. Already the monthly child poverty rate has increased from 12.1% in December to 17% in January. This is an increase of 3.7 million more children in poverty. Nearly 161 kids in Massachusetts are slipping below the poverty line or even deeper into poverty because the child tax credit payments have ended. Food insecurity will increase accordingly. Now, let me ask you a question. Knowing that one senator put his foot down and ended the, child the enhanced child tax credit, how does that make you all feel? Why don't you pop just one word into the chat? <laughs> And while people are doing that, we will have time for questions and answers at the end of the program after we've heard from all of our speakers. This will be fun. Okay, I'm seeing angry, frustrated, helpless, angry, lots of angries. Any other emotions? Annoyed. Annoyed. Yeah. All right. Culpable. Oh, that's an interesting one. Okay. Any gobsmacked out there? Self-reflection there. All right. Well, look, folks, it's really appropriate to feel upset, hopeless, frustrated, powerless, and yes, angry about what is going on. And it, it's really normal. And look, Senator Manchin is not a Massachusetts senator. We have no way to hold him accountable in our values, to our values and interests. Massachusetts senators will almost certainly vote for the enhanced child tax credit in a new Build Back Better piece of legislation. So we tend to think we're preaching to the choir, don't we? We may feel powerless, but we're not. And our senators are not powerless. Senator Elizabeth Warren really isn't powerless. And certainly Senator Ed Markey is not powerless. They will play a role, protect, uh, especially Ed Markey in the um, negotiations around the revised Build Back Better legislation. In November of last year, he, Markey was quoted as saying, we've now seen the evidence, the impact the CTC has, so we don't wanna go backwards. From my perspective, it has to be in. We have a moral obligation. That, that has been demonstrated since July when the first checks began arriving. The evidence is overwhelming. So we've now seen um, that the, the, the um, tax credit is, is working and Marky wants to make it work. But he, uh, he also, and he's chairman of the subcommittee on the environment and public works. He will be key in crafting any compromise legislation going forward. There's a major element related to climate in Build Back Better. It has bipartisan support, enough possibly to pass right now. So Markey has recently suggested he'd like to see something on climate change go through right now. Might this leave CTC out in the cold, even though he has said it's a priority? We don't know. What we do know is that he needs to hear from his constituents about our priorities um, and they need to inform his priorities. So that raises two important questions. How do we go from feeling powerless to having and exercising our power to affect change? And how do you and your churches make your voices heard? So advocacy, the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal. 
So I Googled images of advocacy to adorn this PowerPoint. And the ones that I came up with, I found to be somewhat prob problematic. These are some of the images that I came up with. And once you put in the chat, maybe some of the reasons these might seem problematic to you. Don't seem problematic. Not sure. I'm seeing advocacy. It looks like they're yelling and screaming instead of talking at the, across the table with a representative, right? Uh, they're on no their own. There's not a partner. There's a lot of screaming. And too narrow a definition of advocacy, outside looking in, yelling, right? And, and, and they're too much in your face. Only one person doing it. That's right. We've got one person alone, screaming and yelling, nobody on the other side of the table. Um, and, um, and look, they're all, they're all advocating to the right, as if, as if advocating to the left isn't reasonable. I thought that was interesting. I couldn't find anybody advocating to the left. That was strange. Um, <laughs> coincidental, I'm sure. Um, and then we had this one woman in the middle with no mouth just a sign. I thought that was interesting too, as if, as if placards um, are the most effective form of advocacy. I thought that was interesting. Um, so how many of you have advocated at the state or national level before? Just pop in the chat what you've advocated on. Same-sex marriage. Okay, not a lot. Well, I'm here to tell you that you shouldn't do it alone with a group, with a, with a mixed group. That's a maximum of advocacy. Don't do it alone. Very important. In conclusion, I hope you'll see this as a parable of hope. Perhaps it's true that the poor may be with us always, at least in some way. And we know that the fate, we don't know what the fate of the child tax credit will be this year. It may not pass, but we have learned something really important this year that we can dramatically decrease poverty and childhood hunger in the span of just a few months. And if enough people demand it, if enough people advocate for it, if enough people get into relationship with the Ed Markeys of the world, we can make a difference. That's the promise of our democracy. I want to thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah. So we do have time for questions and answers at the end, but what I'll say quickly about poverty in the Bible is that it is seen as a temporary condition because crops fail, stuff happens. It's not a birth through death situation. And that's something that I think our politicians tend to forget. So next up, Lainey, are you still there? I am. I'm going to make you the host. Perfect. Lainey Zerlin is the individual gifts manager, correct, at the Greater yep. Boston Food Bank. And she's going to tell us what's going on at the regional level, where Sherry told us about what's going on at the national level. Okay, go for it. Well, I think you might have made Sherry the host still. I just made you the host. Okay. Nope, I'm the host. Yeah. Really? Wait a minute. I'm reclaiming host. <laughs> Lainey, you are now the host. Do you want to change the host? Yes, I do. All right. Here we go. Thank you. Got the power. Okay, uh, so I will share my presentation. Put this in. All right, can you all see this? Oh, I'm on the wrong slide. There we go. 
Um, okay, so I assume you all can see this. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Lainey. I work at the Greater Boston Food Bank on our fundraising team. Um, and I'm here to offer you a bit of a regional perspective. I think this will um, integrate really nicely with Terry's presentation. So hopefully you'll have, um, you'll come out with a, a good picture of sort of what's happening in the food insecurity landscape by the time we're done with all of this. Um, so just a little bit of a, a recap introduction for what food insecurity is, how we're defining it in our work at the food bank. Um, we define food insecurity as uh, anyone who doesn't know where their next meal is coming from always. So, you know, you might have three weeks out of the month, you've got your groceries taken care of, you have food, um, and that last week is um, iffy. You might not have, you know, all of your meals are for children who are in school. If they're missing a school meal and then they're um, insecure in, in where their next meal is coming from if it's lunch on a weekday. So that's kind of how we're um, categorizing food insecurity. And you can see the numbers for Massachusetts here. Um, before the pandemic, for a little context, we were at about one in 13 individuals were qualifying as food insecure. So our numbers have gone up. Um, this isn't the highest they've been, but it's definitely, it's high right now. Um, so the, a lot of the reason for that is uh, the cost of living in Massachusetts. So we are all intimately acquainted with how expensive it is to live here. Um, but the pandemic, of course, has just increased that and made it uh, all the more clear how expensive it is here. So um, our unemployment rates are higher. It's remaining about two times higher than uh, during or than before COVID. Um, and even though the minimum wage was just increased to, I think, 14.25 on January 1st, that's still an insufficient number to meet the needs of a family of four in Massachusetts. Uh, so we talk a lot about the, the choices that individuals and families who are food insecure are making. And it's, you know, it's not, um, they're often choosing between all of their necessities. So they're choosing between paying their rent or buying food or paying for utilities or buying food. Um, and in the winter, particularly, we talk about the decision to uh, for heat or eat. So we pay a lot for our heat in the winter um, and that's always an, an issue that we're trying to address. So um, we recently, in 2020, we released a, a food uh, access study that found that food insecurity in Massachusetts has increased by 55%. So that kind of captured the spike right at the beginning of COVID um, and identified adults with children and among people of color as the, the demographics who are experiencing the highest spike. Um, we're currently working on some follow-up studies right now um, and have, sorry, I need to grab some of my notes for these. Um, and have found that um, early feedback is showing that one of the top reasons that people have been turning to food banks and food pantries, as you'll hear from in our later presenters, um, is the cost in, in food increases. So I think we all also saw that at the beginning of COVID, you know, grocery stores were being cleaned out of items. Um, it was driving the prices up. And so that's, of course, a huge barrier to food access. Okay, can you guys still see, am I still in a, in a presentation mode or did I take myself out of it? Now you're back. Okay, I'm back, all right, great. So um, this is a little bit more on just the, the cost of food in Massachusetts. So the most expensive state in the country is Maine actually, and we are the second most expensive, which when you're looking at a map makes a lot of sense because food is coming really far to get to us. So um, the farther you have to transport food, the more expensive it's going to be. And then of course, Eastern Massachusetts is the most expensive part of this state. Um, just contributes to, to the food insecurity. So um, that's a little bit of the environment on food insecurity in Eastern Massachusetts. So um, I wanna kind of give you an introduction to the work that we're doing in particular to address that. Um, so our mission of course is to end hunger here. So eradicate um, food insecurity in our region. And the way that we do this work um, is by functioning as a distribution center. So sort of a common misconception about the food bank is um, that we are giving food directly to the individuals who need it in our communities. And that is not the case. So we uh, have sort of honed in our focus on distributing food, acquiring food, and then distributing it right back out into the community through 
partner agencies. So again, the, the food pantries that we're um, hearing from later is a great example of that. Um, so we have a network of about 600 partner agencies who are giving food directly into the community. So this is just a map of our service area. You can see we go through the Cape and Islands and then um, to both state borders. There are uh, three other, I believe three other food banks in Massachusetts. Um, so one is in the Lowell area, we partner with them. And then there's the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts um, as well. And this is also an interactive map. Um, if you go to this link here, the three meals a day, um, that's an, an interactive map uh, that you can go into anywhere these little green dots are and see what the specific rates are for food insecurity in that um, city or county. So this is um, in terms of how our work has changed pre-pandemic to currently in a pandemic, this is one of the most drastic changes that we've seen in how we're doing our work. So before the pandemic, these numbers were much closer together for the amount of food that was purchased versus the amount of food that is donated to us. Um, so it was about 40, 60, we were purchasing maybe 60% of our food. Um, at at the highest, um, and then receiving a significant amount of food that was donated to us through grocery stores primarily, but we had like some farm partnerships and some other um, partnerships for receiving donated food. But again, as I think we all experienced early on in the pandemic, um, grocery stores didn't have very much food to donate anymore. A lot of items were being cleaned out. They were selling all of their items. Um, and so our donations drastically decreased and we were buying suddenly a lot more food than we had been buying previously. Um, so that was a, a tremendous change. And then of course, with the increase in the cost of food, um, that's been, it changed the landscape of our fundraising very drastically as well, since it was, we were not only buying a lot more food, but it was a lot more expensive to procure. So once that food comes into our building, it's going right back out primarily into pantries. Um, so I, I think a lot of the time when we think about food insecurity and, and hunger relief, we're thinking about meal programs and we think about homeless shelters and soup kitchens and places like that. Um, but it's the majority of it is really going right back out to pantries where families and individuals are able to go in and shop for their food or put in an order beforehand and ask for the, the food that they need um, to take home. So that's um, where our food is going when it's going back out into the community. And then this is a number um, that is uh, something we're really proud of, which is the quality of the food that we're distributing. So 92% um, of our food inventory is meeting really high nutritional standards. We have two nutritionists on our staff who are working, um, they work to, to catalog and keep track of the food that's coming into our building, but they also have programs with our partner agencies to um, to showcase, I guess, the, the nutritious food that's available. Um, and this is something that as it's sort of a hidden perk of, of the amount of food that we have to buy right now is that we have more control over the food that we're able to procure for agencies and for our communities and be able to send healthy food back into the community um, and, and strengthen our communities through that. So this graph um, depicts where our food distribution has landed over the last two years. I wish that I had an extra line to show you what our distributions looked like before COVID to show you the difference in scale, um, because you can see sort of the variations that we've had some months that are higher um, in the second year of the pandemic and some months that are a little bit lower than, than 2020 and sort of the initial surge from COVID. Um, but the, the monthly numbers that we have tracked here show that we're distributing twice the amount of food that we were before the pandemic. But those numbers, um, you know, at, in 2019, our fiscal year 2019, we were uh, really proud of ourselves that we distributed 68 million pounds of food, which is sort of an incomprehensible number. But um, in 2020, you know, we distributed 98 million pounds of food. And that was a number that we thought it would take us at least a decade to reach. We were starting to make some plans for like how, how many meals do we need to be distributing uh, every week or every month in order to make Eastern Massachusetts food secure. And the number that we came up with was um, very close to what we've been distributing through the pandemic. But during the pandemic, it was 
just a response to the need in the community. We weren't strategizing to meet these numbers. It was just an outpouring of support from the community and even providing the funds for us to be able to buy that much food. Um, but then, you know, our the skill in our warehouse and our our distribution services and being able to send that much food out into the community. So um, some of the things that we've experienced, the challenges that we've experienced throughout the pandemic, um, some of the recent ones are with issues with the supply chain. So we've had delays in getting shipments to us. Um, we've also had uh, just the increase in, the same increase in food costs that everybody else has seen. And of course that's been a real challenge for us as well. Um, but we have a generous community, you know, as we're talking through all of this, like the need is really high. Um, and our community so far has really been responsive to those needs. They've heard us when we've been um, sharing these numbers and sharing what this need looks like. Um, they've been responsive. So that's really amazing to see. Um, and as we're looking at these numbers, so much of it is uh, year by year taking it and seeing what happens with the pandemic, but knowing that for individuals and families who are hit the hardest, this is gonna be a five to 10 year minimum recovery. Um, so that's that's kind of what we're settling in and trying to prepare for. Um, so some of the ways I know uh, we were talking about advocacy in the last presentation, advocacy is a huge part of our work as well. Um, donating, of course, covering some of those costs of food and then volunteering. You can volunteer at the food bank or at a local pantry. That is it. That's what I have for you guys. And of course, I'll take questions at the end. But thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Lanny. Um, you mentioned partner agencies and our next two presenters happen to be partners. And first up is Sherry Graziano, who is the operations director for Elizabeth Peabody House in Somerville. And I know um, there's a food bank there or food pantry there and a lot of, um, child after school programs, preschool and stuff like that. So it's a busy place right in the mm -hmm. middle of Somerville. So let's see if Thank I can you. find you on the map here and I'll, mm -hmm. there you are. I'm gonna make you the host. Um, yeah, you, you're sharing your screen, right? Um, I actually am just was gonna um, speak a little bit. I, I didn't uh, need to share any slides, but um, I just had some information, a little bit okay. about the house and um, kind of what we've seen and about our food pantry. So um, thank you so much, Reverend Asella, um, for uh, having me here to speak um, about this very important issue. Um, as you said, my name is Sherry Graziano. I'm the Director of Operations for the Elizabeth Peabody House. I've worked at the Elizabeth Peabody House for almost 22 years. Um, I started as a young mother myself, working there as an assistant teacher, and um, I worked my way up through there and got my associate's degree and my bachelor's degree while working there and taking care of my two sons. So I've been a parent and I've also, um, you know, have worked for the company. Um, a little bit about the Elizabeth Peabody House. Uh, we actually are celebrating our 125th year. Um, the Elizabeth Peabody House was established in 1896 in Boston's West End, and it was named after Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, uh, who was a writer, intellectual, and act, um, activist. Uh, she rallied against slavery, champion for women's rights, educational reform, and she actually opened the first English speaking kindergarten in the US in um, 1860. Um, so when she passed, uh, the Elizabeth Peabody House was created. Uh, there was a big urban renewal that took place and the Elizabeth Peabody House moved um, from the West End of Boston to Somerville in the 70s. Um, we occupy what uh, was formerly a Methodist church. And, um, so I have many people come up to me and say, I got married in this church or I went here in this church. And um, we actually have a blacktop theater um, that still has stained glass. Um, so it's a really uh, cool building where we are now. Um, and to speak to the, the food insecurity, the Elizabeth Peabody House has always been a source in food and comfort. Um, uh, we actually had one of the first pasteurized milk carts in the country, um, encouraging mothers to bring their young children to EPH um, to have fresh milk. 
Uh, and another uh, kind of Elizabeth Peabody House claim to fame is that Leonard Nimoy was uh, an alum of Elizabeth Peabody's House Theater Club uh, and is quoted to remember it fondly and say it was a blessing. It had offered sports and theater and science um, to immigrant families um, and that he and his brother were active in the science club and um, he his brother later became an MIT graduate. So um, he's a, a little bit of our claim to fame. Uh, in 2009, uh, we noticed that in talking with our directors um, that we purchased snacks for children that attend. At the, this time, we had an infant toddler program and a preschool program. Uh, the infant toddler program was predominantly um, teenage mothers as there was a shelter right at the end of the street um, to where our program was located. Around 2009, in conversations, uh, we realized that directors were not only buying snack foods, but they were also buying lunch items as parents were dropping children off and frequently were saying, I forgot the lunch or I'll bring it back or, um, you know, and we were just seeing this pattern. So we always made sure that we had bread and peanut butter and jelly or, you know, some kind of something to, to give to the children. Uh, we noticed that many after school students were coming to EPH and they were hungry um, and they either didn't have lunch at school or they were still hungry from school or their backpacks are filled with snacks because school sees that they come to school hungry. Um, so we decided to use, as I said, we have this really old building in a really large kitchen. So we remodeled that kitchen and we created an emergency food pantry. Um, our modern food pantry, as I said, it began in 2019. It became available to families who were able to pick up groceries when they picked up their children. And then we extended it to um, uh, the community, not just Somerville, um, but anyone that is a resident in Massachusetts. Um, soon the word got out and um, we were serving 80 families per week, giving them uh, bags of grocery staples and choices of vegetables, dairy and protein. Um, we, as stated with Lini, uh, we are partners with the Greater Boston Food Bank. Um, prior to the pandemic, um, we used to go weekly. We now go um, every two weeks to the food bank in the South End with our EPH vans. Um, I actually, in purchasing one of the vans, purchased it so we would have space. It is very, you need very Tetris-like skills, as I'm sure Lena will know, to be able to fill a van with, uh, and anybody in the food pantry who comes after me will know, in, in the resume, we're actually looking for that word, Tetris-like skills, which is the ability to put boxes in, in a way around children's seatings, but we make it, we make it work. Uh, we also receive weekly loads um, from uh, local rescued foods, uh, so uh, Loving Spoonfuls and Food for Free, where they uh, we get a lot of uh, rescued food from Whole Foods, uh, Wegmans, um, places such as that. So, uh, at the start of the pandemic, as uh, Reverend Osella mentioned, we have a preschool program, two preschool classrooms, and we run an after school program and two summer enrichment programs. In March of 2020, all of those programs closed, um, but the food pantry remained. Um, and the food pantry continued through the tireless volunteers, one of which I have to give a shout out to uh, Reverend Osella's daughter, Kate, who Katie, who works with us, um, who's a development associate, but was there in a mask and gloves and giving out food at the door. We all kind of took our turn, even though we weren't at work. Elizabeth House, Elizabeth Peabody House paid all of its employees throughout closure, and we were closed from March 2020 until July 2020. But the food pantry can uh, remain throughout. Um, obviously with some restrictions and um, we used to be set up in the kitchen so that people could kind of go around almost like a shopping experience. And for your family size, you could kind of pick out certain items. Now we uh, pre-make the bags. Um, our current food coordinator, Thomas Strange, um, is really good at knowing what the families, our AE families really lean on. He actually takes polls sometimes and asks them in different languages and has volunteers there in different languages to find out what it is that they really want to make sure that we're getting the items that are the most useful to them. Uh, the food pantry is open 
um, once a month for community members and is open weekly to our current families. Um, they don't get as big as an option, but if our current families need on Wednesday night to get um, and their child is enrolled in our after school program or our preschool program, then they're allowed to come and um, get it back from the food pantry every week. And that extends. I've had parents leave that they still come on Wednesdays if they need it. We're there. We try to be there for them. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, as Lainey mentioned as well, we have been very fortunate to receive grants totaling $27,000 to help with purchasing supplies, food, as well as improvements to the kitchen, uh, new cabinets, uh, restaurant grade freezer, restaurant grade um, refrigerator. Um, we also have received in-kind donation of gift cards to local grocery stores totaling $61,600. Um, so on a very freezing cold night when you cannot have people come into the food pantry or to help um, with our turkey drive that we do every year where we give out a turkey and several bags with all, with all the fixings, um, the gift cards were amazing. And then to offset the family, which does happen, that comes on a Thursday when food pantry was Wednesday night, or um, just for every different scenario, those food, uh, those gift cards were so, so helpful. Um, and finally, we, we received $11,271 in individual donations towards the food pantry. The food pantry is actually not a budgeted program per se. It is run um, primarily through volunteer. It does have a small, we are nonprofit. It does have a small budget uh, line item. But as Lenny said, the, uh, we needed to purchase more food. We needed to be able to, to have access to more funds. Uh, through our development associate, we've been able to write grants where we can now get Tom an assistant um, to help because it's, it's really, it is run on volunteers, um, from the board of directors to local networks to Boston Cares. Um, so it, it is growing and the need is definitely there. We maintained those same number of families throughout pandemic once the word got out that we were still, um, that we were still giving food. Um, something that we see now is um, encouraging healthy snacks, healthy foods. What we're seeing in, uh, we actually ran a learning pod last year um, with our after school students. Um, and we had a lot of um, Uber Eats, a lot of um, things being dropped off, a lot of Lunchables, a lot of, and, and you know, we really try, and even our food pantry, we have a lot of fresh fruits and, we, and when we prepare snacks, our children are eating hummus and snap peas. And, um, but uh, Reverend Arcel and I talked about how it is a lot cheaper for a family to buy a huge pack of Doritos than it is for a family to buy nutritional snacks for their children. Um, that is a huge issue that we see every day um, and deal with every day. Um, it's easy to make the judgment on a family when you see a lunch that, you know, or Uber Eats is coming with Burger King, but it's cheaper to get a, a, a happy meal than it is to get a sandwich with, you know, a typical healthy lunch. Um, so, and that has only, what was already, I feel a really big issue is only gotten worse um, as, you know, the cost of food has, has gone up. Our numbers have gone up. Um, children that are struggling to bring lunch on half days. Again, we're starting to see again, oh, I forgot. Oh, I'm sorry, we'll bring it next time. And we find ourselves yet again, buying um, extra lunches. Um, we have had families reach out that have had COVID and asked us to shop for them because they can't leave their house um, and, and we've dropped it off. Um, so we've definitely had to expand and grow and bend and stretch to meet the needs of our uh, families. But again, without this outpouring of help and support from different agencies and grants and individual donors, I mean, that's uplifting as well, you know, that even though the need is great, um, the, the stepping up has been great as well. So um, that's what we wanted to share. Um, and, you know, we, we, we are, would be nowhere without our devoted volunteers. As I mentioned before, Katie wanted me to make sure to say that it is completely run by volunteers except for the food pantry coordinator. So um, we make it happen uh, every Wednesday because we need to. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sherry.
And as I said before, we'll have questions and answers at the end. Um, we can talk about how you work with the Greater Boston Food Bank, I think. Um, now I'd like to introduce Angela Iaria. I hope I got that right, from the Weymouth Food Pantry. And they're doing things in a different way, which is, you know, I think it's exciting how they're doing stuff. And that it, it kind of plays into what's going on in Somerville, how you've had to be flexible. And if I, where is Angel? I don't see you on the big screen here. There you are. You have to unmute. Let's see. Ah, uh, here I am. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much, Reverend Oxella, for in having us part of this. This is very exciting. I am a poor, poor substitute for my executive director, Pamela Denholm, who is visiting her family in South Africa right now. Very lucky. <laughs> the weather is very nicer than it is here. I get lovely pictures from her in front of beaches with her mom. <laughs> but um, we're holding it down here. And she asked me to step in. I am the treasurer. I've been the treasurer um, for oof, about 20 years now. And it's a wonderful, wonderful organization. We are in 40 plus years as a women's food pantry. We began as a very small pantry out of a church, Immaculate Conception, which allowed us to grow in an unbelievable manner. They never charged us any rent. We lived there in that home until they had to sell the building, unfortunately, and we were looking for a new home. <laughs> so when we did that, we kind of changed everything up and we went to a different kind of model. We were brick and mortar for so long and we had two days of distributions and deliveries. And we had people come in, they would do like a menu and then we would do the shopping for them and they would see their food. When we went to our new model where we didn't have a home, we ended up with a warehouse in Rockland and became a mobile pantry where we bring the food and we partnered with different churches and we now bring our food to our churches. We do three distributions a week and still our deliveries. So it's, it was a very, very different kind of model, a lot of growing pains, but a really, um, great way to expand, I guess, and to reach more parts of the town. Because with three locations, we're able to hit different areas in Weymouth, and Weymouth is quite large. So that was a wonderful thing. And as well, we got rid of the menus and we allowed free choice. So we set up pay tables, put out the food, and people were able to pick what they really needed. And we found that that was um, very empowering to them, because I feel like, you know, this is what you get sometimes is not... Um, because you need it, <laughs> you take what you need instead. So it was kind of giving a empowerment back to our clients. Um, that being said, pandemic hits. And <laughs> as you all know, we, we were serving about 450 to, you know, 475 um, households a year. That went overnight up 35% in April and May in that 2019, it was just beyond. We never closed our doors. We kept going to our distributions. We just had to change things. So when we picked up these 35%, we ended up carrying them through that entire 2019 into 2020. Um, we're now starting to see, well, in 2021, we started to see those numbers starting to trend down, but everything's starting to ramp back up with grocery prices. As you know, everything is just going up, up, and we're seeing more families coming back to us, um, which is nice because I think they found us in the pandemic and knowing that we're there and how we run things and that we're reliable has been a huge, um, just a little safety net for them that they have a place to go. One of the great things that we do is we do a um, rescue program. And that was in 2019, we were getting, I would say about 10,000 pounds a month from just 
having one employee go around and deal with the grocery stores, local places, and just picking up. Um, during 2019, as you all know, there was no food. Greater Boston Food Bank just already mentioned that, that things were drying up. There was nothing to rescue. <laughs> so we went down to 6,000 pounds a month. And even in April and May, that we had no rescue. It was just, we were just trying to grab everything. Uh, we got through those because of the Greater Boston Food Bank. They allowed us to come in, get larger pickups. They let us come in more often. Um, we also were receiving the USDA boxes. I don't know if anybody else were familiar with those, but those were boxes that were coming with fresh food. And that was another thing that kind of like supplemented that rescue. But we were spending more, but as the, um, excuse me, the, uh, the Peabody House mentioned, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, we saw an influx of great support as well where donations were coming in, grants were coming in, everything, people would just wanted to step up. And it was this great underlying story of this time where we're just in such great need, but so, so much great help came as well. Um, like I said, we definitely did not close our doors. We just became extremely flexible. So all of our pups overnight became drive-throughs. So where we were having people come into the buildings, we had to stop that. So now we were, all right, let's prepack bags and get food to people as much as we could. So in that, it's great that we were able to still be open, but prepacking bags means you're removing choice and we're giving a lot more pounds out that may or may not be what they want. <laughs> so we increased our pounds a lot, but not the way we'd want to, I guess is the way we happened, but we just wanted food out. We also have a backpack program, which I'll go into a little bit more in a second, but that also became a weekly thing that had to change. Um, our deliveries, we were still doing our deliveries to our at-home people, but now we had COVID. So we had different types of people now and different restrictions. We had cards, kind of like the Peabody House mentioned, T Town of Weymouth gave us gift cards for grocery stores for those that were, had COVID, just another thing that was just made a little easier to get food into people's hands. And one of our huge thing was you don't say no if someone offers you food. It was yes, 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 yes. We had, if someone had anything, we took it and we'd sort it, we'd figure out what to do with it. If it was not for us, we went to other pantries, couldn't you use this, can you, anybody. So it was a very flexible, flexible structure that we're still living in right now. Um, we've learned that collaboration is the reason our programs survive and they've thrived through this. It's allowed us to maintain and even grow with some of the rising needs and even in with our restrained resources. Um, and all of our programs demand collaboration or they would never succeed. So I'm gonna walk through some of the uh, programs. So as I mentioned, we are what we refer to mobile pantry or we call them pop-up pantries or pups for short. Um, so we have three pups. They're located in different parts of the thing. And we only are able to do this because of church support. We have the first church on Tuesdays. We have Crossroads on Thursdays and we have Old South Union on Saturdays. First church, we kept a... Um, drive through model, and we're now moving back to our inside clients. All through the pandemic, we just did that starting 2021, where we've moved back to inside. Through the pandemic, we've had, just because of volunteers, everything, and clients, we didn't want to risk ex exposure. But now that things are starting to, people are vaccinated, people are wearing masks, we're like, okay, we feel a little bit more secure in having this. But if people don't feel like they want to come, we still wanted to make sure that there was a drive-through model for them. So we did see that that Tuesday drive-through model go up in numbers, which made us feel kind of very happy that we're like, okay, people are using it, using it the way we want them to. And as well, we've seen um, Thursdays go down a little and Saturdays go down a little. But again, now that I'm seeing the grocery stores, things are all ramping back up. 
So another program that we have is the backpack program, which I mentioned just a little bit earlier. And the backpack program is a need that we realized from the teachers. So it's for nutritional needs met on weekdays with school lunch programs, but these children were experiencing hunger on the weekends. So teachers were identifying these kids like on Mondays or something, they were coming in, they weren't as focused. So they're starting to realize that these kids aren't getting their meals on their weekends. So teachers started doing a little fundraising, buying their own food, kind of like you saw at the Peabody House where they're just purchasing things. And we got involved. And once we got involved, we were able to just say, okay, this is a program that is not just happening in this one school. It's happening in all of them. How do we blow it out? So we enlisted all of the schools. We got in with the school system, reached out to the teachers. Teachers were excited for it. And now we do a monthly drop off to the teachers with all of the food. Kids sign up. We try to get as many families. We put them in our pop flyers. Teachers can hand them out as well. And we get parents to sign up for this service. So we already know all of the kids that are on the um, breakfast kind of program in the schools, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other kids that maybe not um, eligible for that, but still need to have the need. We're not turning anyone back who wants this. There's no like things or income they have to reach to get this if they want it. They probably need it and we give it to them. So we have, I think we're currently at 250 plus kids through eight schools. And like I mentioned, monthly drop off and the teachers then take all of the food that we give, pack it into backpacks and put it in the kids' lockers on Friday. They take it home and then they return the empty bag on Mondays. And I guess they love it. They love getting their backpack. They love to get the meals. We do mac and cheeses and things. Obviously, this is our most expensive pro uh, program because of just their kids. They have to be individual. They have to be able to be microwaved. And then we also have a lot of kids that have nut allergies. You get into the allergies, the weed allergies. So there's a lot more um, individualism <laughs> that you can't get away from that you could in like the pups. But again, we're only successful because of the teachers and how they step in. And we've also noticed that when, if someone wants to come in and donate, well, the backpack program is perfect for that. We've had churches come in and be like, you know, we really would like to do a drive for you. And we're like, fantastic. How do you want to, you want to support the backpack program? And how would you like to support the kids that need, you know, that with a nut allergy? So they, we kind of get around buying those most expensive items by being very specific, giving them the list, and they love it because they know the food's going directly to the kids, it's helping. And so that's been a huge success, being able to fund it, raise directly food items, but also money for that. We have our home delivery program, which I also mentioned, and that is for our seniors and adults living with disabilities. Um, again, volunteers are same as Elizabeth Peabody House. We can't do a thing without them. I've got a staff of eight. Pam's our only full-time and I have a hundred plus volunteers. So they're wonderful. They show up and <laughs> they're the people that were doing the driving for us through us. We've recently, very excitingly, hooked up with DoorDash. So DoorDash is now, we're submitting our deliveries to them. They're signing up, they're doing all of the recruiting on their side, getting their drivers and everything, which is a huge load off of us. And we just say where the addresses are, we pack the bags, they come, they pick them up. And this is huge because it allows us to grow the program. Because now that we have DoorDash, it's not about trying to get somebody reliable, trying to make sure, okay, do am I spreading it out, is it enough? Um, DoorDash is kind of taking that responsibility off of us. So this is another, great collaboration that's gonna allow us to really grow this program. And especially in these ones, these people don't get a lot of contact. You know, if they're not going out, we're their only contact. So it's kind of nice, they get to talk to us and order the food, somebody else comes and 
maybe drops off the food and it's a way into their household to encourage them to learn about more community-based support that's out there. So again, we're trying to always lean on some other um, agency and help them to help all of our clients. Another thing that we started since um, Pam uh, is a gardener, she has started two, <laughs> two community garden programs. So we have a garden at Old South Union and that is for, that's our Weymouth Food Pantry Garden in association with South Shore Bank and Old South Union. Now, those are just wonderful, wonderful programs. Can't say enough about them. They're great volunteering opportunities where we can get people, we can get a whole, say a company wants people to volunteer. We need you to come in and weed. We need you to come in and pick. We need you to come in and plant. And it's a great afternoon. People are outside, they're feeling good. And it's been a wonderful way to get into a lot of bigger um, corporations that have those volunteer days. Um, they also provide fresh food for our pantries. We're able to pick them and give them right to our Saturday distribution at Old South Union. Um, recently, we did the teen center garden at youth services. And with them, we're hoping to do more healthy cooking programs or just teaching kids about gardening and eating healthy. Um, but again, we rely really much on our church, the Old South Union, the Teen Center, South Shore Bank, again, collaboration. A new one that we're starting out with is a heat and eat program. And this is where we're pairing up with restaurants. We were really starting to get into this in 2019, pandemic hit, everything got put on hold. So we're trying to kind of revisit that again. And what we're doing with these is we're asking restaurants, all right, end of the day, or maybe well, say end of the day, extra food, package it up into individual microwavable uh, meals, freeze them, and then we'll pick them up and we drop them off at different places that we've given them a freezer and a microwave, whether it's the senior center, whether it's a teen center, whether it's the backpack program that we're adding the, the meals so the kids can just microwave and get a healthier meal than just the mac and cheese or whatever we're sending home. Um, so this is a really exciting program <laughs> that allows us also to get another way to get into the community, get them involved, and also help um, to kind of alleviate us doing a lot more. So as much as we can push on to other people and we coordinate, it just makes everything better and easier. So this is a drive that we're very excited in getting started. And then Pam had also put in this new program. This was just a note she gave me. And I, unfortunately, she didn't get back to me as to where this is. But she said that there was this um, public access fridge is a new initiative that she saw happening where they take a fridge in like a community center or something. They fill it with eggs, dairy, fresh food. I mean, it requires a daily checking, a daily replenishing, but it's been really, really successful for people just to be able to go in and grab something when they need it. And I just thought that that was a fabulous idea, <laughs> like just refrigerator and some people. So those are the programs that um, we, we run some of the things that just I, I think I've said church supporting them and work together has just been amazing. Um, one of the things that we would like to say is that when you put the food pantry at the center and have the other people supporting them, it works a lot better than having people working in their own little silos and trying to work individually. Um, you your congregations have skill-based resources and those are the things to, that will help you resolve and get through the challenges that uh, a lot of the food pantries are facing. And if there's already a food pantry in the church, um, encourage them to get their own 501c3 if they haven't already. It's a fantastic fundraising strategy because 
so many of this grant money that we go after, it's not rewarded to religious organizations. And it's a kind of a way of opening up your doors. It can still be associated with your church, in your church, but as their own 501c3, they're gonna be able to get to more grant money than you might've been able to on your, or your own or in a partnership. Um, but we're stronger together. And like we said, collaboration and partners is the way to go for us and how we've been able to be so successful. So any questions, we'll take them at the end. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. That was cool. Um, I'm going to unmute everybody. Or you can unmute yourself if you have a question. And I think what we'll do, I can't see myself anymore. I can only see Angela. Um, Let's start at the top. If we have questions for Bread for the World, we heard issues about politics there and economics throughout this and the price of food and all that. We happen to live in the wrong part of the world as, as far as cheap food goes. Um, but we used to do, Stan and the, the, the Mission and Justice Committee, we used to do offerings of letters. Sherry, is that still an effective means of affecting it is. advocacy? It is. More and more we do the offerings of letters in conjunction with um, congressional visits. So we ask congregations to write letters to their uh, uh, congressional, um, you know, their Congress people and their senators. And then we follow it up with a, a visit to their office. We, we ask, we set up a visit to their office. We'll deliver the letters in person and, um, and then do a, a visit where we talk about what, we're, what we care about. And we learn what the congressperson and senator care about um, and then try to, um, try to come to some agreement about what we can work on together, build a relationship. Cool, thank you. Any other questions for Sherry? You can unmute yourself at this point, I think. Because I can't see everybody's face. All righty, we'll move down to the Greater Boston Food Bank. Does anybody have a question for Lainey specifically about how that operates on a regional basis to, to get out to places like Kingham or Hull or Weymouth? And what are the mechanics? Any questions there? Okay. Either that or nobody can unmute themselves and I can't do that. I have a question for the Greater Boston Food Bank. Go for it. Um, Lainey, do, have you seen uh, the effects of the, the child uh, credit in, in your work? Um, that's interesting because I was actually, when you were presenting, thinking like, oh, maybe this explains some of the numbers that we've seen just in, in certain increases at specific times. Um, so I actually didn't know as much about that before you presented. So I haven't, I haven't connected it specifically for our work, um, but we did, I mean, we've looked a fair amount at the um, the stimulus checks that actually, I think we've probably seen more from the other side since I'm on the fundraising part of things. Um, we saw a lot of people donating their stimulus checks um, and saying, I don't need wow. this. And so that's, we got a lot of donations from people donating their stimulus checks. So for the child, uh, the child tax credit, um, I, I didn't know as much about that. And for me, it was more informing like, oh, <laughs> I think that probably has a lot of impact. Um, so thank you for sharing all of that. I think I can take that now into my work and, and talk about it much more, um, oh, with a lot more information. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Now, Sherry Graciano and Angela, you both mentioned, I don't know if you made a change midway or, or what, but you talked about how people are now free to pick what they want and, and kind of like the shopping experience that you mentioned. And it occurred to me that enabling people to take what they need is good for them because you know, you're getting what you would buy if you were at a store, but it also helps the pantry too, I would think, because it means you don't have to buy the junk that nobody's taking anymore. So you can focus only on the, the things that people really want. 
Are you seeing that, Angela? We see that a lot. We actually will see a lot of things. If you give out something and you're seeing it come back in your donation bins, <laughs> big indication. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want that. <laughs> we see it outside. There's like some some bag trading outside. Yeah, so exactly. When you continuously see the the black the pinto beans, the dried pinto <laughs> beans, a bag over to the side over the. Okay, so that was like the last kind of voting he did was like how do you want your beans <laughs> you know like we know you want your beans you don't want them dried obviously so you know because we do like the whole purpose of it is to not take things that you're that cause more stress and that you're having to go home and figure out how do I make this how we want you know a, a, a big um demographic that we serve is um Haitian the Haitian community people from yeah. El Salvador people from Nepal you know what I mean rice is a huge staple like that's a part of every single meal that's something that we need to make sure that we we have um but there's other things that like they don't you know what I mean they don't get touched like no no thank you you know what I mean like um and and so I think a really good um kind of fallout from this, as, as Lainey said, is, is being able to get more specific things. Whereas before, when you're, you know, you when you don't have a large budget per se, you're having to get whatever's free, right? You're not, you're not being able to actually purchase. So as a really small food pantry, it was, we had to get whatever was out there. Um, and it was kind of like a, you get what you get and you don't get upset kind of thing. And so now the, the food cards, the the extra donations, the extra funding have really allowed us to tailor it to um, really serve the families and give them what they need um, for what they're making culturally. Yeah. And as a, food, as a food pantry donator myself, I'm sorry, Angela, um, very briefly, I've learned to not buy things that require other ingredients to make the meal, but like the difference between a condensed soup and a ready to eat soup, same thing, except one requires a can of milk added to it. If you don't have milk, that doesn't help you. And other things, um, I mean, rice is a big one. You can cook rice as basically as you want, but some things require some kind of oil. Now I have to go get that. So I can't make that dish without all these other ingredients. That, that's a good point where we try like once a month to have make sure oil is in our distribution for that week so people can grab it. We also had a kale incident where we had a lot of kale. <laughs> people, kale don't really, incident. <laughs> <laughs> people don't really gravitate towards kale, but we started a, a lot of times we'll if we know there's a food that they're not going to really get into, we try a recipe to go with it something that we're giving uh -huh. them the ingredients, the basics, and here, try this. And a lot of people will try it and, and come back with it. So that, that's kind of one thing that we've learned is that recipes, people will take them, try them, and do if you can get an easy one. And so something to think about. I've got a book downstairs. I'll forward it, the information to you. It's... Um... I forget who published it. I think it's through the Milk Street Cafe. And there's all these really great recipes in it. And they, they limited them to six ingredients plus spices, you know, salt, pepper, whatever. And the whole book is built that way. And they're, they're meant to be put together quickly and yeah. inexpensively and without 10,000 steps. Exactly. And, that, and that's a good point because that's one of the things that we've been talking about is trying to do like a spice donation where people donate spices because they're so yeah, I was gonna say the same exact thing right because right? people church, use them yeah, and a spice your, drive right? uh, everyone in the church we did a spice drive and we asked them to bring because that is the one thing that um is not we do not get a lot of um, exactly spices. and you're not going to spend your you, you can't feel well spending money on spices when people are yeah. donating, you want to make sure you're getting them the staples and stuff. So doing a spice drive is a nice way around it, right? Yep, yep absolutely. absolutely. They're on my list too. Susan Domi Allen, I see you there. You raised your hand. How are you? What's up? I'm good. I'm good. No, I wanted to thank them all very much. But I see that I think one thing that's very important for us churches to remember is that um, if we're donating to food pantries that have a lot of um, ethnic families in the area, that what we think we might 
should donate is not necessarily what they are going to want so that maybe we should really ask for a list yeah. for the food pantries that we donate to so that we're not overloading the pantry with something that they really can't use. We love that. We try to put something on our website as well of things that were when we're looking for things. Um, but yeah. like I Facebook said, pages. yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, when we have someone come, like when we have that church come in the backpack, that specifics was great. And also another program where you give people a bag and a list of items and it's you, it's almost like I'm trying to think Pam had mentioned it and it's just coming to my mind now where we go to a company and they hand out to their employees, here's a list with a bag and they fill it up and they collect it for us. They do the sorting and they just drop it off. So kind of on that line where you're dictating the items that you really need and anything that we get pre-sorted, we're all about. <laughs> less waste and less unnecessary expense. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Raising the hand thing, that, that worked really well, Susan, because I can only see four people at a time here. Okay, any others? We're getting on, we're, we're almost at an hour and a half. So maybe we'll just wrap it up and thank all of you for being here and thank our presenters for all this good stuff. Um, let's see. We can send out links to all of your organizations in a follow-up email, email when we send out the video link. And that might help drive people to you because the Greater Boston Food Bank interactive map, that looked like fun, but you know we'll have to check that out later on. So getting a link for that would be good. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, enjoy the rest of the day. Notice the sun is still up. It's not like December where it's pitch dark by now and it's blue skies. My thank computer's so telling much. me it's raining, but it's not. Yes, thank you thank so you much for putting this together. This yeah, was wonderful. Yeah, sure. and, and for people- I've learned a lot as well. Interested. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Sherry, thank, thank, thank you. you. Sherry yeah. twins, only one That's letter. Right. <laughs> Sherry, my daughter Kate says, she said, feel free to quote me. She's the very best. <laughs> well, there we have it. Yeah. it it's on public record now thank you thank you she's the very best she's she's she taught after schoolers how to knit i have an after school knitting club there you go. Miss katie right now that's who awesome. says that no i i got my nine and ten year old going are we knitting today i come in and they're rolling <laughs> they're rolling and i'm like what <laughs> Hey, am I? What have I traveled back in time? So we love Katie. <laughs> we love Katie very much. And um, Peabody House, we are. If you go to our website, we are hosting 125th soiree right. um, in April. Um, and so there's more information about that at our at our website. Um, I hear you have a jazz band coming. There is a jazz band coming. I am trying to um, woo a local uh, Boston 25. Uh, got a celebrity to MC, but he's not returning my emails anymore. <laughs> Try channel four. WBZ you know, will do it. All right. All right. I'll float, I'll float out there. But yeah, so there could yes. possibly be, you know, some. And, some and that's local. at the Harvard Club in Boston. Is yes. That right? Yes. At the Harvard oh, Club. That's yeah. awesome. Congratulations on 125 years. That's insane. Thank you. Go to the party. It, it's great. You can go, you can buy tickets online. That's awesome. At yeah. It's an amazing. .org. Is that it? Yes, teph.org. It is a, um, we're very fortunate. It's an amazing program. Um, mm -hmm. and it's like a family um, in all aspects. So um, yeah, so thank you so much for allowing us to talk about this and this really important, um, this really important thing. Sherry, I learned a lot. I have so much notes. Like we got some some grant tidbits in there today, Sherry. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's what it's all Love about. Cross-referencing right. each other and people got to mm. eat every day, right? Exactly. Right, right. On okay. that note, thank you, thank you all. all. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.